Good morning, everyone. As we wrap up October here at St. Matthew's Church in Glendale, California. Here at St. Matthew's, we had a combined Reformation Day service with All Saints Day service. Those of you who know a little bit about Reformation history know that on October 31st, Luther posted his 95 theses, his 95 points of debate as uh, an introduction to people for All Saints Day, knowing that people would be coming to the Castle Church on All Saints Day. He posted the theses on the 31st, and that was the lead-in then to All Saints Day, and of course sparked the Protestant Reformation. So we remembered those who have passed away and those who have been uh, inspirations to us in our lives, loved ones who have gone to be with the Lord this day. We are in Bible study now, back in 1 Corinthians, and we're going to be moving into 1 Corinthians 14. So you can start to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14. Try to think of chapters 12 through 14 as kind of one block together. It's split into three chapters, and 13 almost seems separate. But really, 12 through 14 is a continuous thought, and the continuous thought is about spiritual gifts. We really hit that in chapter 12. We'll hit it again in 14. But it's not 12 and 14. It's 12 through 14, 12, 13, and 14, which are all tied together dealing with spiritual gifts, because 13 was focused on what spiritual gift? love as the absolute highest spiritual gift. So as we talk about spiritual gifts, understand that the way that Paul's picturing this, the way Paul is phrasing this as he writes, is that all of these other gifts are, are wonderful, and he talks about how they benefit the church, and in 12 he kind of talked about not, not using big hierarchies and not using one gift to look down on another, but that Love is the most important of all of them, and even if you have all kinds of other incredible, amazing gifts, they're just a loud brass or a, a gong if you don't have love behind it. They aren't important. Love is the most important, and so these other things pour out from that, and that is where they find their importance, where they find their value to the church. And that's really kind of the focus in 14 is how now do these gifts then work for the church? What is, what is the role of the gifts within the life of the church? And how does the Holy Spirit benefit the church through these different spiritual gifts? And so he's going to talk again about some that he sees of particular value, and he's going to deal again with tongues, because tongues seem to have been an issue at this point in the Corinthian congregation. But in back of all this, continually keep in your mind that the highest gift is love, and all of this pours out from that. And so measure everything in terms of that. Okay? Uh, he's really wanting to avoid the, this sense of pride, arrogance, a super spirituality, super Christian above everybody else. That's kind of what he is now. Having said that love is the most important, we're going to see how we don't want to end up in those ways because we have certain gifts. Carolyn, would you read chapter 14, verse 1, please? Make love your aim and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. If you remember at the end of chapter 12, there seemed to be a verse where it almost goes with 13. It really does lead right in as far as, but now let me tell you about the greatest gift. And then we heard it was love. And now as we go into 14, the way that it's been broken down for us. Follow this way of love. That's the most important. And if you're following after love, if you're following the way of love, then you start to eagerly desire the spiritual gifts as a result of your love. Because you have love for one another, before you, because you have love for Christ, you now desire the spiritual gifts because through the spiritual gifts you share that love. So desire these different gifts now as a result of your love, as a manifestation of your love, as a way of sharing your love, and especially the gift that you should be looking for, hopefully, is prophecy. prophecy. And remember that one gets a little sticky because we think of it often in terms of almost a fortune-telling ability to predict the future, and that's not really what the word prophecy means. Prophecy is about the ability to proclaim God's word. 
And so, if that is an important spiritual gift that he's telling the Corinthians and us, that we should be now desiring, that we should be hoping for, that we should be praying for, because we have the gift of love and we want to show that love, we now want the ability to proclaim God's word because God's word is ultimately a word of love. And so we're desiring, the word is the same, uh, it's the same root word for zealousness. We want to be zealous as we ask for this gift. We want to be ambitious for this gift. It could be to be zealously wanting to have the ability to share God's word with others. That may come in public proclamation or preaching, that type of thing. But the gift of prophecy is also that ability to, to share God's word in smaller settings. Verse 2, uh, Clara with the glasses, are you wanting to read or no today? No? Okay. How about we go down to Tracy? You're muted. Do you want to read? Sure. Thank you. For anyone who speaks in a tongue but does not speak to men but to God, indeed no one understands him, he utters mysteries with his spirit. So apparently what's been going on in Corinth is because of the unique uh, unique visual audio aspect uh, of of the speaking in tongues something which has been has some parallels in pagan culture also paul sees that a crisis has developed in corinth as some people who have this very obvious type of gift are apparently holding it up, uh, up over others. And this is part of the dissentiousness that's been happening there, the divisions which have been happening there, the rivalries, the arrogance have somehow been related to some people in the congregation having that gift and some not. And so he says, one who is speaking in this tongue is not really speaking to men, but to God. The people don't really understand it. Instead, it's some sort of mystery, an unexplained mystery, which is happening as this person is speaking. And so he's setting the stage for his discussion of this is this is kind of some sort of language between the person and God, typically. Not solely. He's going to get into different things. But his first statement about it here is it's somehow a connection to God rather than to the church. Verse 3, Judy D. On the other hand, he who prophesies speaks to men for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. So apparently there in Corinth, people have really been lifting up this gift of tongues. And Paul says, hey, how about focusing more on prophecy? Because that's more important, because that's the ability to proclaim God's word. This this speaking in tongues, whatever exactly it is, is more about your relationship with God, but what you should really be earnestly praying for, be zealous for, be desiring, is the gift of prophecy so that you can share God's word with others. That's the most important thing here, because it will strengthen. What do you have besides strengthen? Upbuild. Upbuild. Upbuilding. Edif Upbuilding. Edify. Edify. Edify is a very literal good one. It's it's edify literally means to build up, and the root word is similar to the root word for house. So think of building a structure. When we talk about the church being edified through something, it's it's building up the structure of it. With this gift of prophecy, as you're able to communicate God's word to others, it is building up the church. It's strengthening. It's building the structure up. It's also giving encouragement. Or what other translations do you have than encouragement? Consolation. Consolation. That's kind of the third word. You probably and sometimes word, translations yeah. move them uh, in different orders. So. Encouragement can be comfort. It can be comfort. It's the uh, it's the same root word, the paraclete, paraclete, which means the Holy Spirit. We refer to the Holy Spirit as the paraclete. 
and that's the word for comfort. And so sometimes we refer to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Comforter. Same root word here of this. It, it literally means to call to one side. The Holy Spirit comes and is the Holy Comforter. I heard a pastor once when I was uh, a kid who referred to it, picture Holy Comforter as that old security blanket that you've got at home. It may have holes or whatever by now because you've had it so long, but when you wrap that around yourself, there's still that warm feeling of you're safe and you're nurtured. It's that calling to side. That's really what the word is here. When you are prophesying, when you're proclaiming God's word, it is encouraging, it's comforting the people who hear God's word. Think of uh, if you were at St. Matthew's this morning and talking about the resurrection, as we think of those that we have lost, that's supposed to be a word of comfort to encourage us. And also then the last word can be comfort or consolation, which is kind of a word which is related to the paraclesis, but it, it has more to do with cheering up. Think of cheering up. So when we proclaim God's word, we encourage the church, we comfort the church, we cheer the church on as together we hear God's word. Verse 4, down to Pam, please. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Now, most of your translations say the church. Does anybody's translation say a church? Or just church? Leaves out the definite article. Almost all English translations supply the definite article, which is not there in the Greek. And they try to do that, or they tend to do that, because Paul seems to be specifically talking about the Corinthian church. But it's interesting that he does not use a definite article here. It really should literally be translated, he who prophesies edifies a, the, a church. It's almost like it's this uh, local use. He's specifically talking about having the gift of prophecy is good in this local congregation, in your local setting. This prayer between you and God edifies you, it builds you up in your spiritual relationship with God. But more important, he's saying here for the good of the church, is that in your church, in a church, that you have the gift to prophesy in this church, to share God's word with those who are in the church. Verse 5, Dennis, please. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. Now, he's not going to get into a deep explanation of what this is, and scholars differ on this. Is this... What he seems to be saying here, it's almost something that's just a, a language between the person and God. Some refer to that as a prayer language. Other scholars would say tongues is specifically Acts 2, where the apostles speak and everyone hears it in their own language. But that doesn't seem to be what he's talking about here, because he's saying that not everyone would understand, whereas the whole Acts 2 story was about everyone being able to understand. So there's some variances here in scholars. I don't think we have a complete picture of this is, but he says it'd be great if you all had that ability to have this, whatever this connection is with God and speak in this way. But more important is this ability to proclaim the word. I would rather that you all be able to share God's word. We, we kind of talk about that in terms of evangelism, do we not? That would be the greatest thing is if we could all share God's word with other people. Of course, that's not as easy as we might say it is at times. We get nervous. We, we live in a society where we're not supposed to talk politics and religion and all those different hindrances. And it's hard to talk about those things which are deep in your heart. But that's what Paul's calling to be most important, is that we be able to proclaim God's word to one another. But if he is going to be doing this, he's going to get into what interpretation might be and what that might involve a little bit. But the focus is on do those things which are going to build up the church. That's the thing to be most important. And again, put this into the context of Corinth. It's not our context. 
there may be some some corners of the modern Christian world where this is more of a debate or divisive or whatever. We're not going to have arguments in most congregations over, well, I want that gift so that I can have this special thing and that shows that I'm a super Christian and you're not. We don't really experience that. But that's what's happening in Corinth. So measure all his words against that's the issue that they are facing, not that we necessarily are facing, and I would say we're probably not facing. Verse 6, Diane. Now, brothers, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophesy or word of instruction? So Paul here makes it clear. He can do this. He has this gift. What good would it do if I brought it to you? Now, here's where it gets a little bit tricky. He says, what shall it profit you? What good will it be if I brought this to you? And then translations, unless. Do you have anything else there in connecting these two phrases then, unless? Except not. Except, okay. That, yeah, that is good. It, in a sense, it almost sounds like a saying, this gift of tongues isn't really any good for me to use in front of you, unless in these tongues I'm bringing you some special revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction. But remember that that's not what he's talking about when he's talking about prophesying. He's talking about the ability to communicate God's word. What good would it be if I spend this time doing that? What's more important when I come to you is not that you see that I have this spiritual gift. What's most important when I come to you is that you hear God's word as I'm proclaiming God's word. Unless I speak God's word, that's what will profit you. And so he's putting his own gift kind of here on the sideline to focus on the gift of being able to proclaim God's word. Uh, are we up to my screen shifted around? Everybody's messed up. Uh, Judy H, please. Oops. We're beyond seven. Uh, yes. 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 Yeah. If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? So here he's kind of comparing it. He's using a little metaphor here. We might say that whatever this language is, if people don't understand it, it's kind of like, yeah, you can have wind blowing through the flute or the harp. Uh, but if it's not actual notes being made, it won't make any difference. Do you remember in Amadeus, uh, you remember the movie, or if you've seen the stage play Amadeus, and uh, Mozart's getting all kind of grief, and he's trying to change things and be very progressive. And the, is it King Leopold, whoever it is of Austria at that time, it critiques one of his operas, and he says, oh, dear Mozart, it had far too many notes. Right? That the music was just too much music, is what he's kind of saying. It was too hard to listen to. You don't want a cacophony of sound which makes no distinction, not that Mozart does at all, of course, but that's kind of what Leopold is accusing him of. It's just like too much stuff going on. You're not making any sense out of it. Paul's saying it has to have some sort of, it has to be in harmony. It has to be playing specific distinctions in notes. That's, an, uh, that's a metaphor, and in eight, he's going to continue that with, what are we up to, Scott? Uh, uh, let's see. What, number seven? Eight, please. Eight. Eight, eight, okay. Um, for if the um, bugle produces a, an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? And uh, well, I don't know if anybody else is served uh, other than Scott here. I I haven't, but think of, you've seen it certainly in the movies, where the whatever Revly or call to go into when the bugle sounds, you've got to be able to distinguish those notes so that you know what you're being called to do. Retreat, advance, whatever it is. The reason for blowing through the shofar or the bugle or the trumpet is so that it's magnified so that you can hear those different things different than somebody shouting a command. It can't just be a blur. It has to be distinct. Let's go to Jean. Have you read? No. Uh, Jean 9, please. So with yourselves, if in a tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, 
How will anyone know what is being said? For you will be speaking into the air. Remember, this is that he's used it before, kind of beating your fists in the air like a boxer shadow boxing. If this is just an unintelligible and nobody there knows what's going on, you aren't really accomplishing anything except you're kind of just your shadow box and you're just throwing your fists in the air. Gladys, verse 10, please. Yeah, there are, there are yeah. but perhaps, perhaps, okay, let's see it. There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world and no kind is without meaning. All these different languages, somebody can understand it. Maybe I can't understand it all. If you can picture, is that John Houston who did uh, in the 60s, the movie, The Bible? Anybody remember that? Uh, the Bible, and it just kind of tells like several stories from the beginning of the Bible. And the way it pictures the Tower of Babel, they're building this tower and their you know, man is showing the great power of man. And then it says that God confounds the languages. It's the kind of telling this symbolic story there of the Tower of Babel. And in the way that Houston prepare, uh, shows it in the movie, all of a sudden they're talking, but all of a sudden nobody understands each other anymore. And so work on the tower just goes by the wayside because they can't communicate anymore. If I, all these languages have meaning, but if nobody understands, we're not gonna get anywhere with this. And he continues that thought in 11. Uh, Karen? If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. Foreigner, what other translations do you have? Barbarian. Barbarian is more literal. The word is barbaros here. Think of what that meant in this context. So in Greco-Roman society, particularly in Greek society at this point, the Greeks believed that there were Greeks and there were barbarians. The Romans kind of carried that along too. And the way that you could tell if somebody was not a barbarian is if they spoke Greek. If you didn't speak Greek, you were considered a barbarian. The Egyptians had done something uh, similar earlier on. Actually, they were probably uh, earlier even than the Greeks. We get our word jargon. Think of jargon. It comes from barbar. -bar. It sounds a little bit of a, uh, a stretch, but that's where it comes from. Barbar -bar is from barbarians, and from that we get jargon. And what is jargon? Gibberish. That's not really gibberish. Yeah, just words. Um, when we say somebody's using jargon. Idiom. Idioms very much can be jargon. <coughs> not uh, clear. Not clear. Not it's not clear to everybody, but there are some people that it's absolutely clear to. So uh, let's say we uh, go over the hill and we get a bunch of guys from JPL and we're sitting there at lunch with them and they're talking <laughs> and work, right? They all know exactly what they're talking about. But you and I are probably going to sit there without the slightest clue because they're using their jargon, which makes perfect sense to them. But I'm a foreigner to it. So it does not do me any good to be part of that conversation. Verse 12, Janet, please. So also you, that you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Is it wrong that they speak jargon or that they have jargon? No, it just simply no. doesn't communicate to the rest of us. It's like, uh, I mean, pastors can be guilty of this too. Uh, it's always a danger to use any Greek or Hebrew from the pulpit because sometimes it's, it's used by certain clergy to kind of sound very educated or sophisticated or erudite. But if you're not explaining what you're talking about, not many people sitting out there speak Greek or read Greek. So unless you're being very careful about how you're explaining it, it's probably not doing anybody any good. Certainly when a group of pastors might sit around and talk about a certain word or a group of engineers or whatever the field, it's great for them, but it doesn't communicate to everyone. 
So if there's something that you should be zealous to have, and again, he's using the word zealous here, if there's some spiritual gift that you should be zealous for, be zealous for the gifts that build up the church, in particular, that ability to communicate God's word to everyone, not just to have a language, a jargon that only a few understand. And we'll see. That's kind of a pause point where he's going to talk a little bit about interpretation. We'll pick that up next time. So we have a minute or two for questions before we pray. Not a, not a single question. I have a question. Okay. Why don't they use, you know, the um, prophesying? Why isn't that more clearly written? Because I sort of everybody I think I know was looking upon it as, you know, those people that are going to say, you know, the end is near and in 19, you know, or 2027 on June 4th, you know. That's because of how we have come to use that word in the modern sense, but that really wasn't how it was meant ever. Where the difficulty comes in is if we look at like the Old Testament prophets predicting, and of course there's the word prophet. They're a prophet not because they're predicting. They're a prophet because they're proclaiming God's word. For those Old Testament prophets, there were times when they said, hey, Jerusalem, you're about to be destroyed because God was speaking that message to them. But it's it's almost coincidental that it happens to refer to the future because what they're really talking about is get your house in order, Israel, or this is going to happen to you. But the emphasis isn't on what's going to happen to you. The emphasis is on this is what you're supposed to be doing, Israel. And if you're doing this, you don't have to worry about that. Of course, it doesn't turn out that way too often in the stories. But the focus is on proclaiming God's word now. It's I think it's because we have that attachment and then that gets further complicated in the modern american religious mind in that so much of evangelicalism is wrapped up in bad interpretations of revelation and so many people in certain uh, evangelical evangelical traditions uh, are so focused on the Schofield Bible. If you've ever seen a Schofield Bible, it's basically one man's interpretation of things. And some scholars say it's almost as though Schofield's notes, his little notes on the side from this one guy, which are printed in those books, people start to read it like it's part of the text. Well, it's not. Schofield's notes are one man's not particularly good interpretations of certain verses, but it has come to shape so much of Christianity in America, especially Southern Christianity, which then spreads out as American evangelicalism throughout the country, uh, that that focus has been so misplaced on revelation when that really should be a minor part of teaching. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. It's kind of, and it's isn't it cool to study revelation sometimes, and we have, we've had taught revelation. Uh, because it's kind of spooky. Who put the pastor's office is spooky on the sign-up sheet today, by the way? I, I it was a Halloween joke, I guess. But but people hear that, and it, you know, it's kind of that. And you can make good movies and stuff out of it. So it, it triggers our mind, but it's not. It, it's almost like the gift of speaking in tongues. It shouldn't be a primary thing. The important thing is communicating the word of the Lord as far as God's love and the way of salvation through Jesus Christ. Okay. I'm so glad that you described that because now as I, you know, read my Bible and, you know, in the mornings, it has a complete different context for me. I always puzzled over it and just kind of went, well, I just don't know, you know? And so it, I, I, I'm coming away from this Bible. So I always come away from Bible study, learning something, but this one was, you know, all these years, I just had never, nobody had explained that before. <laughs> so thank you. And there's no perfect explanation, I should say. Oh, I stopped way too early. My clock's fast, sorry. Uh, 
there's no perfect explanation and scholars disagree greatly as to what this means and, and what what the gift is and uh, we don't have any great perfect definitions but Paul's focus is in emphasizing the importance of proclaiming the word rather than getting wrapped up be it the gift of tongues be it the gift of or not even a gift being it uh, getting wrapped up in trying to think of what all of this means in like a Hal Lindsay's late great planet earth type stuff that's such a minor part of the word that that's not where your focus should be great well thank you Good. well on this All Saints Day, in company with all the saints, we pray to God for the needs of our community and for the world. We pray for the leaders of the church. God, hear our prayer. God, hear our prayer. We pray for the leaders of the community. God, receive our prayer. God, receive our prayer. We pray for those who do not yet believe. God, receive our prayer. God, receive our prayer. We pray for those who are suffering, ill, and coming to the end of their life. God, receive our prayer. God, God receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Giver of life in your goodness, you invite us to share in your glory. May these prayers we have made find favor with you. Bring us one day into the company of all your saints. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. All right. By the way, everyone.